Hi, everyone. My name is Lori Forcier. I'm the Chief Global Content Officer for Learn It, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this virtual event. Our mission at Learn It is simple. We exist to support the meaningful conversations that education leaders want and need to have to make change happen. And we do this through our in-person event, which will next happen in London, January 19th to the 21st, 2021. And we do it through virtual events like this one today. Uh, today we're talking about blurred lines, which is all about what successful virtual learning looks like, and what it can look like, and how it might change schools. With COVID-19 driving a rapid acceleration and acceptance of virtual education, alternative models of K-12 education are in the spotlight like they've never been before. Online options that were previously considered to be less than, virtual schools, a la carte options, online professional development for teachers, are now of deep interest to ministries, districts, school leaders, teachers, and parents for a variety of different reasons. So one of the big questions is, will this exposure cause alternative models to become mainstream? And will alternative models help traditional schools provide better educational and life outcomes for more students? So to help us talk about this question today, we have four panelists and excellent moderator. Joining us, we have Lee Buddy Jr., who is the principal of Wade Park School, uh, in the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. We have Shona Pilgrim, Principal of Ansford Academy in the UK. We have Atala Wahidia, the Director General of General Education and Senior Advisor to the Minister of Education from Afghanistan. And we have Julie Young, Managing Director of ASU Prep Academy and ASU Prep Digital in the US. Our esteemed moderator is Lord Jim Knight, who's Chief Education and External Officer for TES Global here in the UK. And just a few notes for me on the format. We'll start as we always do with a moderated discussion for the first 45 minutes. Then we'll turn to Q&A for the last 15 minutes. Uh, the Q&A function will be open throughout. So go ahead and submit your questions as you have them. We'll be selecting questions that resonate across the group and asking our panelists to address them at the end. And with that, I turn it over to Jim. Thanks very much, Laurie. And, uh, and thanks for inviting us. We've been looking forward to having this, this conversation about uh, successful virtual learning and, and how it will change schools. And in my sense, in my country here in England is that this last three months has shown how brittle our system as a whole is with some notable exceptions of school leaders who've shown that they have a real capacity to innovate. And you know, for some in a way they've been preparing for this for some time. Uh, without really knowing it, but the, the system as a whole hasn't got the resilience uh, that I think it really needs because in part it's not far enough on the adoption curve uh, around the use of technology, but not technology for its own sake, but some of the changes uh, in, in what you can do as a result of adopting that technology in terms of a flexibility around uh, time and space, the ability to differentiate more acutely for learners. There's a whole range of, of different possibilities that are opening uh, opening up and have been opened up uh, by this uh, by this crisis and by and but by the technology and what the crisis has done i think is it's forced a very rapid shift in the adoption curve um, but quite where it'll end up and whether or not there will be policy makers trying and and practitioners trying to drag people back uh, on that adoption is is one of the questions that we might want to explore. There are other questions around how whether it's impacted positively on some learners being able to uh, to learn in this way, um, whether teachers, well, how far short of the training need that they have they are, where we are on pedagogy around being able to use technology intelligently and to blend it with face to face. Uh, whilst preserving the crucial role of the teacher in all of this and not trying to replace teachers with technology. And obviously there's, these apply not just in the K through 12, the, uh, the statutory schooling ages, but they go on through lifelong learning into further and higher education too. And we might hear a little bit about that. So I'm, I'm excited to explore all of this. Um, I want to turn first of all to Julie, who's got this wonderful, rich experience, uh, both uh, running virtual schools in Florida, which is probably one of the biggest scale virtual schools anywhere on the planet, I think, um, 
and then at ASU Prep. So, uh, Julie, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so I'll give you just a little bit of background about ASU Prep Digital so you can kind of understand who we are and what we do. Um, ASU Prep Digital is actually a vehicle that Arizona State University is using to advance next generation education models. And, you know, keeping with uh, the discussion about blurring the lines and uh, how we remove barriers, we're designed to actually transcend that traditional boundary between high school and college and eliminate those barriers that we have artificially um, as human beings and educators that like order put in place for our kids such as their age their grade level their location modality all of those things that we kind of sort kids uh, into categories we are pushing away so that our students, our high school students, can actually uh, start college anytime they're ready. Whether they're 13 or they're 18, uh, we enable them to actually come into ASU and uh, have created over 200 pathways into the majors where the students have the opportunity with the support and the handholding of ASU Prep Digital and ASU Prep Academy to um, actually get into a major in high school and have that experience. It's not dual enrollment, it is actually ASU. So um, more about that later, but ASU Prep Digital is part of ASU Prep Academy, uh, which is 11 schools on seven campuses and ASU Prep Digital underpins the entire academy with the, um, uh, the vision that uh, as ASU Prep Academy exists to create new education models for success, ASU Prep Digital enables that to scale out to the world. So as the pandemic hit and when we all went virtual in March, we were ready because we had started to prepare our teachers two years ago for um, becoming blended models and really working deeply on personalized learning and starting to infuse a great deal of digital content into our schools. And we also sit in the middle of Arizona State University. And for those of you who may not know what that means, it is the largest university in the US and it has been named the most innovative university for five years running. Um, we have a remarkable president, President Michael Crow, who believes deeply in all realms of learning and is constantly um, trying to create new pathways into the university and new ways for students of all ages to learn. And so uh, ASU Online uh, has been around for, I think, eight years now. And so that too enabled us as an entire institution to be ready and literally within 24 to 48 hours, all of our students at all levels, uh, K through life went virtual. And so the digital team uh, in regards to the academy supported all the training and all the activity along with the, the leadership of our brick and mortar, we call them immersion sites. And uh, we provided ongoing uh, training as the teachers got into this, I mean, granted, our um, uh, immersion sites, which is, again, our brick and mortar schools, they, there are about 3,200 students in uh, those uh, schools. And so all of those teachers, none of those teachers had actually taught virtually or worked remotely prior, but they had started to use some of the digital content, some more advanced than others. And so, it really did give us a bit of an edge and we had quite a good experience with um with our students cool and uh, it's asu i'm trying to remember is asu the, the university that did the deal with starbucks around their people being able to uh, yes. have starbucks fund their learning yeah president crow actually has uh trademarked a phrase called universal learning and what that means is that we wanna be the place at ASU that um, 
we, we open our arms to a, a, a universal learner, which could be a learner who's 90 that wants to come back and learn a skill or, you know, a student that's in kindergarten or first grade and then everything in between. And so uh, what we've done at ASU is created all these different ways that students can come into the university and be accepted, even if they're, you know, they just completely messed up their high school experience yeah. and so forth. Cool. And uh, the post-COVID is the wrong word, but, uh, you know, as we start to release from lockdown, certainly, um, is that we obviously are moving into a, an intense economic recession, or we're in one already, uh, and that we have traditional higher education really struggling to work out how to cope with social distancing, how to cope with uh, embedded use of technology to deliver, how to deliver a value for money for quite high levels of fee when it's all going to be online and they're not going to be able to deliver the face-to-face -face experience in the rite of passage. So you've got HE facing big challenges and then you've got a, a youth unemployment problem, meaning that the two main destinations out of school are looking pretty tricky. That must drive people in the direction of people like ASU and then anyone else who can uh, mimic what you're doing as a sort of safe haven while we ride this thing out. Is that something you're seeing in your enrollment for next year? Um, it actually is. I mean, we're obviously seeing a little bit of a, we're seeing the decrease of our international students that were immersion students previously or on campus students, obviously because of the pandemic, but we're seeing an increase in our online enrollment, both at the K-12 level and at the higher ed level. Just to put that in perspective at the K-12 level for ASU Prep Digital, we're actually like exponentially um, kind of off the charts right now. We were expecting to serve um, about uh, 22,000 enrollments this year, and that would equate to about 10,000 students, individual students. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will actually finish this year, actually today is July 1st, finished this year, serving 32,000 students and about 13,000 individuals. And when we planned for summer school this year, which we're in the midst of, uh, we planned for approximately three or 400 students this summer. And by the time we finished both the June and the July session, we believe we will serve about 4,000 this summer. Uh, so the growth is exponential at all levels. There's lots to explore. I want to hear from the others, but we'll we'll come back to some of this. I mean, I think, you know, the sorts of things that I'd like to explore further are, are around how ready learners are for this different style of learning um but we'll we'll hear from others and then we'll we'll maybe come back to that as uh, as others will have their perspective on that question uh, too so um lee let's let's come over to ohio and uh find out a bit more from you where you know one of the really big challenges that we we constantly are coming back to here in my country is the digital divide and that um, it's all very well having wonderful technology at Arizona State or, or wherever else, but if people have unequal access to it, um, we are entrenching disadvantage. We are not uh, really addressing the mission of education, which is to release everybody's talents. How are you tackling that in, uh, in Cleveland? Thanks, Jim. So definitely when we, when school shut down in March, over half of the children in Cleveland did not have um, internet access to internet, um, didn't have a device. Um, so the district, you know, it, it took the district a minute to bring on additional partners and to purchase devices for students. Um, my school, we, Wake Park, we immediately reached out to our community partners. And I mean, within two and a half weeks, I mean, partners had donated 
um, over 150 devices. When school shut down in March, we only had 75 devices in our building for over 520 students. Um, and, you know, we, we were receiving calls from parents, you know, we know you guys are getting ready to start a virtual learning. You know, how are you going to support my child? My child doesn't have a device. My child does not have access to internet. So, you know, we were really were not in a good place, but, you know, we definitely looked at it as an opportunity to bridge the gap. Um, so, you know, getting ready to start, you know, next school year, you know, we now have enough devices for all of our students. Um, the district has provided hotspots. Um, we have a new partnership with Verizon. So all of our fifth through eighth graders will have an iPad and um, Verizon is paying for their data. Um, the district has also partnered with an organization here called Empower Cleave um, and Digital C. And Digital C will pay, um, Dig Digital C will provide internet for that child as long as they stay in, as long as the family has a student in Cleveland Metropolitan School District for the life of the child. So uh, we, we're already getting families signed up. They're starting installations actually end of this week. Um, so, you and, know, we and really sorry, are those, are those deals publicly funded or are they um, philanthropy from the, uh, the telecoms companies? So the, the group got started through through with philanthropists that, that you know, put some money together to form this group. Um, the district has committed to X number of, of scholars between now and the start of school um, with, so they're hidden different neighborhoods throughout the city. So, you know, for the neighborhoods that will not have access to this high speed internet service that's free, the district has already um, paid for over you know, a whole number of devices for hotspots. So families will have the option to, if they need internet to get a hotspot device that the district is paying for, or to go through this service that's more of a permanent service for them. Cool, cool. So that, that, that's pretty much taken you to a confidence level that anyone who wants to get online at home to keep learning can do. Yes, because I mean, right now the district has all of all of central office staff, principals, directors, coordinators into 10 different groups that is looking at, you know, partnerships, um, the health of the child, um, teaching and learning. So we're really, we're looking to really reinvent um, how education is done for a child. So there's different models that um, the district is throwing out there um, that we hope to really bring it to fruition at the start of this school year. So the district is, you know, a lot of other districts, um, you know, nationally has already released like their, you know, their plan to start next school year. Um, Cleveland is not planning to really, really release their plan until end of July, beginning of August. Um, so they're really taking a thoughtful look with, you know, how we can meet the needs of every child and really reinvent, you know, what education looks like in this new normal. Okay, I'm resisting the temptation to comment that that doesn't leave much time to plan for those delivering on the ground to uh, so to ask you about what that education then looks like, because obviously it's all very well to deliver the infrastructure, but if we're going to deliver the social and emotional aspect of learning, if we're going to really deliver for these people as humans, it's more than just about content delivery over video. Absolutely. So how do you reconcile all of that? So, I mean, one of, one of the working groups that we're working on is SEL. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, several schools in the city, our school did um, during the virtual learning sessions to end last school year, um, you know, each day we started with, um, you know, a class meeting, um, SEL lessons, um, because definitely, you know, with us not being able to see our, our scholars face to face, um, you know, 100% of our scholars are free and reduced lunch. They, they deal with a whole lot of challenges in their house, in their neighborhood. So, you know, part of us starting each of our sessions with a class meeting and having, you know, follow up one to one sessions with scholars that we knew were having some challenges. Um, that is something that we're looking to see how we can address to start next school year. 
Um, you know, here in Cleveland, we use a program for our kindergarten through fifth grade scholars um, a couple times a week um, that really focuses on their SEL. And then like middle school uses another program. Um, so, you know, between our paths and our second step, curriculum that is used, that's kind of what we're looking at now to see how we can take that program online because, you know, that was a challenge where, you know, it had a lot of, um, you know, like for, for instance, for kindergarten, they use different puppets um, where, you know, they, it helps a child express how they're feeling. So, you know, those are, those are the type of things that our working groups are looking at now to see how those things can be taken virtually if we need to continue with you know, all virtual lessons in the fall or if it's a blended, or if it's a blended, um, blended model. And in thinking about what happens when school comes back, there will be some of your young, some of your scholars who essentially have been through trauma mm -hmm. and you're then going to have to work out how to support them without necessarily being able to have much face to face contact. Is that, is that all part of your planning? So that's part of the planning now. I mean, actually, as we're on the call right now, um, our, we have a mental health agency um, counseling service that works that's in our building um, you know, during the normal school year. Um, our, our, our counselors have been reached out to students over the summer, so they've expanded their hours um, and have already kind of changed their framework of how, you know, how they support scholars. So uh, one of our therapists actually just texted me with a concern that she's working on right now this morning. So it's kind of been an ongoing service. It has not been a, been a situation where the school year ended and the scholars that we were already working with did not receive any service, services, but we are already thinking about how, how can we increase those services because um, they were only servicing a certain number of students in the building, and we know that we have already had an increase of, of families reaching out um, for services over the summer that weren't being serviced before, um, and, and families reaching out in terms of, you know, what the, what the service options will look like in the fall, because they are already dealing with or had some situations this summer where um, the student has exper experienced some trauma, and they really want to get their child some help. So that's an ongoing conversation right now, but we've already kind of shifted to services where in the past we did not have a lot of options for, for families in the summer. And this summer we have all of our therapists and counselors that are on board working and reaching out directly to our families. Cool, and I'm, I'm gonna to go to Shona in a second, but um, I know that Shona's done lots of work around student agency and empowerment um what place has that had in building that social and emotional resilience in in your scholars league well i mean we we recently um we recently had some scholars that were um on the local news um i know education weekly just did an article on our student and um, student ambassadors our student leadership group in the building so we are continuing to work with our student ambassadors in the building in different capacities. For instance, um, earlier this week, um, there was a need in our in our local neighborhood. Um, someone had dropped someone had dropped um, dumped some trash on one of the roads. So um, one of the community leaders reached out to us to get some kids. Um, the week prior, they did a beautiful project in their community. So, you know, obviously with us practicing social distancing and, you know, I'm ensuring that the kids have masks on and different things like that, we have been looking for different opportunities to keep our student, our student leaders engaged um, with their school and in their community and um, really been able to op continue to offer services online for them. You know, we have virtual lessons for our kids four days a week over the summer, but, you know, with, with some of the community projects that they've been doing recently. I mean, that's just one way that we're keeping them engaged and just, you know, really helping to empower them um, to understand that, you know, this is their city, this is their community, and they have a voice in it. Cool. So sure enough, um, it's a long time since I was in Cleveland. I've, I've been in Castle Kerry a little more recently. Um, they're quite contrasting places um, from a, a big North American city to uh, rural Somerset 
um, but that doesn't mean it's without challenge. What's your story been? Okay, so you're absolutely right. Um, my school is in a tiny rural community in the southwest of England. Uh, it's a really small school as well, um, and a really um, underfunded school in a national context in, in the UK. So we're in one of the worst funded areas in the country. Um, we, uh, six years ago, when I became the principal at Ansford, had a really big conversation as a community about what we wanted our kids to be like when they left us. So what our Ansford graduates would be like. Um, and every time we spoke to anyone, they kept saying, we want them to be independent. We want them to be able to do it for themselves by the time they leave us so that they can go out into the world and they can grab whatever opportunities are there. And they're not relying on other people um, to give them the skills or the knowledge or the confidence, actually, the nous to go and make that happen. And I said to everyone that I was talking to, if we want that to be the case, then we've got to do something differently. We can't just sit here every year and complain about the fact that they're not independent if we're not willing to do something different about how we enable them to become independent. And that's going to mean us changing everything that we do. Everyone agreed that that was what we wanted. And that was like a carte blanche for me to say, okay, then, so we're now on a, on a trajectory to sort this out. And uh, we became involved in technology um, as an agent to allow us to give our kids independence, to allow them to be able to learn at their own pace, to allow them to set goals for themselves and then work towards those goals. I should say though as well that it's always been a real driver for us that, edu um, that technology wasn't the main thing. The main thing is the independence, it's the agency and it's the relationship with their coach, the person who works alongside them, the adult who works alongside them, uh, to hold them to account for their goals um, and to challenge them to really um, you know, put their money where their mouth is when it comes to achieving uh, what they say they want to achieve. And so it's the agency, the technology and the relationship coming together that is where we are as a school. We don't have a huge amount of money, as I said, so um, we do have devices for all of our kids, but they have had to be bought either by their parents or by us. And so when we went into lockdown, we had about 400 of our 600 students had devices we had about 200 in school. We no longer have any in school. Um, and I have no confidence that we'll ever have them back, you know, but the most important thing is that our students have devices um, and they were able to access um, our schooling from March. It was really important to me when we went into lockdown that Ansford as a building might have closed, but the school remained open in all of its aspects virtually. And so that mindset of we are still open and we are about, about more than education as a school, was really, really important in framing the mindsets of our students, our parents and our staff. And you know, the, the mantra was, um, we're gonna make sure that we do what we can, not just what we have to. And so every time we've been talking about anything, it's been about what would help? What could I do that would make this a little bit better as an individual for the individuals within the community? Um, and that's led to us doing all sorts of things across the school community that you know some of us me included have not always been comfortable with um, but we've known that it's been the right thing to do and the example i shared with you jim before is my daily videos to the parents i hate doing videos they're my least favorite thing in the whole world but they're important because um, as the leader of that community it's my responsibility to hold that community together and to set the mood music um, for that community and to make sure that everyone is able to get through this um, hopefully but also to be honest with people when I'm not hopeful, when the days are hard for me, because they need to see the humanity behind the leader as well. So we have maintained all of our contact with our parents, all of our contact with our students. We maintained our school structure all the way through the lockdown. So we have the same structure to the day that we have in school. So the students have lessons that they are expected to attend, um, although they don't have to. And that's the slight nuance. So we um, have been working on this agenda of agency. And one of the things that was really important to us was at the beginning of the day, a child with their parent, with their teachers, can work out what their day should look like. And they don't have to necessarily be learning at the same time as someone else, as long as they know that if they need help, that help will be available during their normal lesson time. And they can't expect their teacher to be available at two o'clock in the morning if they decide that's when they fancy doing history. So it, it's been about letting them know what's available and then getting them to work to program their day to fit in what they need to do, to prioritise the things that help them meet their goals, but 
but then also to find a rhythm that works for them, a rhythm that allows them to learn effectively, but also allows them to stop and look at the view, to actually do some of the things that we would always have wanted them to do when they were in school, but we were so caught up in the systems and the structures that we didn't stop long enough to value or allow them to do the things that we said were really, really important. And I think for me, that has been the most important thing about lockdown, that our kids have had the opportunity and our staff actually for, to find a rhythm and to work in a way that works for them. And so while there's a, a basic um, requirement that people will do what they should be doing, there's also a huge amount of flexibility to set it up to work in the way that works for you. My staff have been amazing. They have done live teaching right since March. Um, Google Hangouts, we're a Google school. We don't have a huge amount of um, whizzy technology. It's really basic. But, you know, the connectedness allows us to keep teaching. And against union guidelines, um, the staff have said, you know what, it matters to us that we engage with our, our kids, that we still have conversations with them because conversations are important in learning. They just don't have to happen in the same building. And so I'm really excited about what might come next, really. And I love the, um, we do what we can, not just what we have to. Um, there's two uh, questions that, that flow from that for me quickly. One is, um, my suspicion is that you are unusual um, and that there are, uh, too many of our school leaders or, or school administrators to translate to our North American friends um, who are, are just trapped in a culture of compliance and they do what they're told um, rather than thinking, yeah, but I could do this right now. And that, that's been really testing for most school leaders, not to say that you haven't been tested, but um, is the, am I being unfair? No, I think the biggest test for me has been actually hearing people describe what you've just described um, and just really wishing that they could see that they have more power um, to be able to affect a change to the way that things are than they perhaps realise and that if they could just stop for a moment and stop worrying about what everyone else is telling them to do and could really think about what they're trying to achieve for their community, they may actually um, be able to say no to some of the noise um, that is getting in the way of them actually uh, doing what they want to do. I mean, the classic example is um, the government decreed that all of our year 10 students, so our 14, 15 year olds who are doing GCSEs next year, should be back in school. Now, our virtual learning is so good that I would argue that they are worse being back in school because if they're in a socially distanced environment and the teacher is at the front, two metres away from everyone, the interaction that they're going to have with 15 of them and one of the teachers will be less good than if they're still at home. And so we had a conversation with parents and said, actually, in our judgment, this is not the right thing to do. So if you really want your child to come in because they're not accessing learning in the way you want them to, then that's fine and we'll facilitate that. But if you don't want them to, if you're happy that they're making progress and we're happy that they're making progress, then why don't we just continue with the way that we are? Um, and so, you know, it's about knowing what you want, I think, and knowing what you're trying to achieve and then being um, brave. I hate that word. I don't know why we have to be described as brave for doing the right thing. But, you know, just saying, actually, this is what we're trying to achieve and this is the best way to do it. And it's not necessarily, in fact, I would argue sometimes it really isn't all being in the classroom, 30 of you, with one fraught teacher who is trying to frantically get around all of you and meet your needs. But actually, yeah, you could yeah. be at home and it could be a lot easier. I think I'll come back to the other question, which is what happens when the regulators kick back in and tell you uh, what you have to do uh, rather than what you can do. But, um, uh, and that allows me to turn to a government advisor. Um, uh, Wahidja, um, obviously you're in a very different context in Afghanistan, but one where I guess virtual learning I'm guessing might have been thought of as a, a sort of luxury add-on, a nice to have if you could afford it, um, rather than suddenly being an essential. How's that, how's that journey been? Hey Jim, thank you. Uh, I, I think you have put it very, very, very positively. I just for, for all my audience to put this entire thing into, into, in, into context. 
uh, with this entire COVID issue, we ended up in a, in a situation where uh, uh, from a, a public, from a public joke, we are virtual learning uh, was considered as a public joke. If you go to someone in this country and ask them that I have studied uh, online or virtually with stuff like that, uh, you will you will get a very interesting smile back, telling you that you have just probably cheated someone uh, to get to get a certificate. So that was the kind of public uh, perception of the of the virtual learning in this part of the world. And in less than in less than few weeks, it has become a national uh, reality and a national need that we need to have something in in in, in place. We quickly responded to uh, to that because my part of the world uh, is not familiar with uh, with the virtual uh, uh, stuff here. Uh, uh, everything uh, that is that is done in person to person contact is being considered something uh, of a real. So now we 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 ended up in that kind of situation. All schools uh, on on the lockdown. Everyone uh, we were on the on the on the lockdown. So we had to go for uh, for the online uh, uh, online solution. We immediately responded uh, uh, and tried to do at least something to keep the children busy at, at home. We went for uh, uh, um, uh, recording the lessons and uh, uh, airing them on our educational radio and TV. And also we got uh, about eight hours of a time uh, slot uh, on our national uh, TV to broadcast uh, the, the lessons. And then here we have two languages, so uh, two national languages. We have uh, broadcasted them in, in two languages. We also put all those uh, uh, videos and, and, and stuff on the uh, uh, on, on online as well. Although internet connectivity here is, uh, when when Shona was 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 talking, I was feeling that if I divide Shona's situation over a hundred, probably that would uh, re that that would show the context that that I I, I work in. So with, 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 with a few months passed, now there is a very emerging and strong feeling in the system that we need to have, regardless of whether the schools open or not, uh, we need to have this system strengthened. First, probably this is the easiest, the cheapest, and the most flexible approach uh, uh, that, that, that we can have in the system is an, an alternative learning pathway. Uh, and uh, that is, that is uh, at, at maximum. And at minimum, what it can uh, do in contexts like Afghanistan, where you have teacher quality issues, uh, a lot of teacher quality issues, it could be a support function for our teachers to learn from and prepare themselves by listening to all these uh, these lessons, and also it could be could be a very strong supplementary materials that uh, students will have access to, and we also believe that it will boost this uh, this technology culture uh, in, in 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 this country who, uh, by having all these small small chips with all this uh, all your textbooks and all your uh, lectures in. So that is that is the kind of uh, of view uh, we are we are we are currently uh, holding. Absolutely, there are challenges to it. There are uh, probably equity issues with it because technology is not uh, available to to many many in this part of the world. There are uh, issues with special uh, 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 you know children with special needs, and so there is a list of challenges that you can go on 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 on. And those challenges probably are there with, with our with our normal uh, with our some of uh, those challenges with our normal system uh, system as well. So it may not be only specific to this. Only its uh, its uh, appearance or the shape or the the, the the structure is 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 a little a little changed. But we are working on um, uh, on, an, on a national scale program. We have started uh, as I said. We have started something. We are trying to streamline this for a maximum of alternative learning pathway and for a minimum of uh, complementing uh, the, the, the quality aspect uh, of, uh, of our learning. We are uh, concerned uh, about how best uh, in many uh, component we can attach to it so that we can make sure how in future we can uh, assess all those learners who go through this program because 
uh, we believe that that is the most tricky bit of it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and we need to make sure that we look into all the possible potential holes and, and how those holes can be, uh, can be fixed. It, uh, Jim, it has also created a very interesting opportunity of, of, of regional uh, cooperation. Uh, because Afghanistan gets its internet from its, uh, its uh, generous, uh, generous neighbor, neighbors, and uh, uh, and uh, I, I, we, we believe that uh, with with the with the infrastructure challenges that everyone faces throughout the world with this COVID issue, and everyone is uh, focusing on on, uh, on on the on the on the internet. Probably a coordinated, a regionally coordinated approach for coming up with a with a regional solution for online learning is something that is increasingly, increasingly uh, encouraging us to, uh, to, uh, to to look at. And we we believe that uh, a regional perspective uh, will will help us reinforce uh, 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 each other's strengths and, and probably weaknesses. And we will be able to at least have, uh, you know, in this part of the world, we are very good in, uh, uh, you know, in confronting each other. We are, we love confrontation in this part of the world. I think this is this is a new area where it is encouraging cooperation for good. And a very interesting bit of this is that uh, uh, there is nothing in this to confront with each other, because end of the day. We are delivering services to our students, and probably our neighbors will be delivering services to their students. So there is nothing that, that there is no pie of the cake that we can just start confronting, like the geography here. Like every day we fight over the geography. I think this is something that is helping us to 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 have a blueprint of a, a true regional uh, cooperation in this part of the world. Sorry if I have I have said it very 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 long, but I just wanted to give a perspective. No, that's great. Um, we're going to be moving to questions very soon, but I, I'd very quickly like to just get around each of you and, and ask you, Rahidja, when you started, you said that um, the perception was that online learning was inferior learning. Um, has that changed where you are? Yeah, it has dramatically, it, it has dramatically changed. Like uh, I interact with probably uh, even with this entire Corona restrictions, I interact with 50 to 60 people on a daily basis. Before Corona, it was uh, you know uh, close to 1,000, but now we have uh, all these restrictions. And everyone who comes and they tell me, look, our children are now learning better with this TV thing. Uh, they, because it is also flexible for children. They just pull the children in front of the TV for uh, some time. They don't have a teacher to be shouting at them. They don't have a problem of uh, asking the homework and all that kind of stuff. Probably the students realize that, look, uh, this is a better option rather than being in the class so, and being asked for all that. So I think that is encouraging so, students to learn. And that's also uh, giving a lot of satisfaction to the families that they believe that this is a good alter alternative. So will, they, will you still be doing it in a year's time when hopefully the virus is less of an issue? But if People think it's it's good. Do you think it'll be maintained? I believe that it, there will be a very strong uh, uh, push for it uh, from from the public side uh, uh, that we need to continue this, regardless of whether schools are open or closed. This is what I'm uh, sensing from my and, conversation. And, and Shona, will will your parents want your um, flexibility around time? For learners to be able to learn more independently and more when it suits them will they want that to remain and will the regulators allow it uh the parents it's a mixed picture so the ones who have really understood how much of a difference it's making who um have listened to what's going on and really been able to see it really want it but some parents are so used to education being in another form that actually we've still got quite a lot of education to do with them about how it can be different without them feeling that they're doing something wrong for their child. Will the um, regulators allow it? Probably not, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can't make it happen. So um, I'm just really hopeful that there might be some give to allow some innovation and some agency from individual schools um, rather than a draconian approach, but I fear it may be the latter. But we'll just have to do it anyway. If, 
if we do manage to see more of that, then I guess that makes life easier for you, Julie, with people coming plug and play ready and, uh, you know, good for, for online learning uh, from day one without them having to learn the, the protocols and get the competence in how to do it. I think, I think we should all think about the fact that of how we do our work, even, you know, no COVID and we do our work in, in an online uh, fashion in, in many respects, many of us work remotely or in the office or a combination. So we really believe that every student should have an online experience prior to leaving high school because that's the way the world is learning. Um, yes, they, have the opportunity for a combination of both immersion and um, online learning. But um, uh, in order to be prepared for college and career and life, they have to know how to learn this way. So we believe there is great value in that alone. And, you know, so, so love to have a whole conversation about this one, but I, I do think there is a group of parents that, had a terrible experience and states yeah. that shut down. But there's another whole group of parents that kind of went, wow, I really kind of like being this engaged with my yeah. children's learning and they want a hybrid offering. And we'll, we plan to do one in the fall, but we plan to continue it after COVID. And Laura's about to pitch you in with some questions, but Lee, just tell, tell us where, where does your community sit on the equity between online and, and, and offline learning and which, which they prefer? So we have a small percentage that, um, we're, well, we have a small percentage that definitely values and, and, and appreciates everything the teachers did during the shutdown. But uh, a lot of my parents work multiple jobs and, you know, that's been their concern in terms of, you know, in the fall, if we move to a hybrid schedule, you know, who's going to watch my child? I need them back in school. I trust you guys. I know you guys will have some safety measures in place to keep them safe. So, you know, we, that's kind of, you know, different, you know, feed, the different types of feedback that we're getting right now from our families, but a large majority want their child back in school. Yeah. And that, that's where the rubber hits the road is the economy needs a universal service for children that can allow parents to work too. Um, Nori, what are we getting from the Q&A? Well, I'd say the, the first question I wanted to bring in, which I think is completely aligned with the, the discussion that you've led thus far, Jim, is you know, there remains a perception among some parents, definitely among teachers, that virtual learning is inferior learning. And what's the work that needs to be done to convince or demonstrate or show people um, the, the, the kind of success that each of you has seen in your own work? I, uh, I, I think, uh, can I jump in, Lori? Yes, please, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe that uh, uh, a strong assessment system that have, a, uh, that have a public confidence in, attached to an online learning in the, the producing evidence would make, uh, would, would give an opportunity for the online learning to prove that this is, uh, not less than uh, the, the, the kind of, we call it the, the normal learning. I think this is what the parents tell me all the time. They say we need to have a strong assessment system in place so that we can really, really check and make sure that we know that the students have learned uh, or acquired the, the, the skills. And also we need to have some kind of a, a platform where we can do the the kind of competition between the, the, the virtual learners and the, and the normal kind of learners so that uh, the public or the community see the evidence out there. And I think that is going to, to, create, uh, to create a lot of uh, confidence. Uh, on, a, on, a, on a lighter note, I am not very sure that the teachers will love it because probably down the road that is going to decrease the, uh, uh, the number of teachers that we would need in our, in our system. So probably that is it on that, uh, on, on that note that will not be a, a good sign, but this is something that for countries that are like us is cheap. Uh, we, in affordability is high and especially when everyone have so many things to take care in this part of the world. Uh, uh, that providing that flexibility to the learners is, 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 is also a very important uh, component. 
Okay. I think Julie wants to come in on this as well. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, we need to be somewhat deliberate about exposing the good and the quality programs. And so that, you know, as you listen, for example, to Shona talk about her program, very much mirrors our program and what we've been doing with our brick and mortar schools as with our full-time digital school students, then there are key indicators of quality programs. And so I think we need to, to do a better job of, it, of exposing the, the, the quality programs. I also think um, to the point about the teachers, uh, teaching online and teaching in the classroom are two very different things and it requires different skill sets. And we can't assume that every teacher that has been teaching in the classroom wants to teach online or even has a skill set to teach online. And what we just experienced was every teacher being forced to teach online. And you know, with with you know, building the airplane while you're flying, um, in terms of of how they were trained. And so I also believe that we need to start with our teachers colleges across the country and that this has certainly revealed a gap in teacher education in terms of we need our teachers to come out of college knowing how to teach in all these different scenarios and these different modalities and Julie, so do you, do, you, do you think we might end up at least temporarily with a workforce model where we have some teachers who kind of prefer and are really good at the online learning uh, and yeah. Obviously, you've got some pupils who need that that delivery model because of uh, circumstances. Absolutely. So you, yeah. you then remodel the workforce around teacher preference yeah. that way. I think you absolutely can with and it doesn't mean that you have to go out to, you know, an, an online provider like us, although that's great. But it, it does mean that that the teachers that you have, you really need to understand what they want and what they're what they're willing to learn and what they're capable of and and not force them into a situation where they're not going to be successful. Yeah. Can you just say a few things Julie you mentioned there are some key markers of quality online programs. Can you just share with us a few what a few of those are? Absolutely. I think the um, high, we we think about high tech but high touch is incredibly important and we have many families who do believe that this is a better education for their children than the traditional model, that they have this constant communication from their teachers. They know at any given moment where their children's gaps are because they can see within the system, the analytics or through the communication. Um, students need to be pushed away from the computer in quality programs so that they are not sitting in front of a computer all day long without interaction between other students and, and their teachers. Uh, students come together and they have peer relationships online. Um, oftentimes there's some off, um, uh, some real time face-to-face -face components of full-time virtual programs. But you know, it's, it's, it's also that flexibility model in terms of you know let's take advantage of this medium and recognize the fact that all students are not the same and as we know we have been sending high schoolers to school for how long in the dark when their brains don't work and so give them the flexibility to work when they need to work within the parameters and the guidelines um, that's great. I, that leads me into a question that I want to pose to Shona and, and Lee. Um, we, we've had actually two questions from the same person um, that I'm going to put together in one. Uh, and she was asking um, how the teaching methodology differs from in class to online. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about that in your schools. Uh, they were also curious about what your current tech stack is. So what, do, you know, what kind of tools are you using? Okay, so shall I take it first? Sure. Um, so first of all, our tech is really low tech, as I said. So we, um, we've we used the freebies on Google uh, education for the vast majority of things. So everything is delivered through Google Classroom um, using Google Hangouts. We do have some specific um, tech like Century Tech, which is an online AI um, powered platform that we use as well. But the main thing is everything is in Google Classroom. So the child has one place that they go uh, where their teacher is, 
for Hangouts, where their work is um, posted, where they turn in their work. Um, how the pedagogy has changed is really interesting. The best examples, it hasn't really changed a huge amount. It's probably become um, clearer what the teacher wants the child to do and the child is very definitely in charge of, of what they're doing and, and what they're aiming to get done and can do it at their own speed. So there's no teacher standing at the front talking for so long that the child doesn't have time to do their work, um, which I would argue is a step in the right direction. Um, but in terms of the way that the teacher interacts with the child and the child being able to email and have a conversation individually or join a hangout and hear the uh, teacher explain a novel concept or talk about misconceptions, actually it's the best of what you would have within the classroom with all of the other stuff that goes on in the classroom like classroom management, um, making sure kids are sitting where they should be sitting, picking them up on their uniform and not having pens, picking them up on the, the talking. So actually I think it liberates a lot of work time and time for the teacher to interact around learning um, and takes out a lot of the other stuff that goes on in a classroom that isn't helpful. And, and do you still need invigilated assessment? Um, well, we still do assessment, but in a, a sort of different way, really. So it's much more real time. Um, I should say that we don't do a huge amount of assessment in school anyway. Um, I would love it if we could get to a point where we didn't do any written feedback ever, because I think it's the enemy of a teacher having any work-life balance. And actually, I think kids learn best when you talk to them and when you tell them what the next steps are, rather than writing them a letter while you're at home. Um, so, you know, the, the assessment we're trying to get them to do is kind of questioning as we're going on. We haven't done formal exams because to be quite frank, I don't really think they're fit for what we're trying to achieve here. So it's very much been about a child submitting their work, turning it in, and then the teacher giving them feedback and them improving it um, and having a conversation a little bit like you would if you were, a bit, you were doing a PhD and you were having your viva, I guess. Yeah, Talk to yeah. me about your learning. Does, that, does this chime like for you, Lee? Lee, does this chime for you? It does. Um, we, we use Zoom as our platform. Um, that was one thing that we're looking to tweak for the start of this school year if we move to a blended option because um, our teachers, you know, would have the virtual sessions and then students were email, would email their assignments into the teacher. Um, but we're looking for kind of more of a uniform platform, kind of like Google um, that she mentioned in terms of just having one platform that everyone's used and the students are able to, to submit their assignments. Um, like that because students would you know email their assignments and then teachers would would offer feedback and email them back to students and then you know some students you know may not readily check their email each day so that was a delay so i know we're looking to looking for a new platform for the fall okay and and your your teachers in terms of their confidence in the pedagogy and the difference between online and face-to-face -face, uh is that that's part of what what you're preparing for now? So the the state superintendent in Ohio put together a commission of different stakeholders, and they have condensed Ohio learning standards um, because that was one thing that teachers kept saying. With you know, how are we supposed to cover all these different standards? Um, you know, in this in the, in this new normal. So I know that's one thing that you know, our teachers are excited about in terms of having um, less standards, but being able to go deeper um, into the standards, um, whether it be face-to-face -face or blended for next school year. So, I mean, that's one thing that we're excited about that Ohio is ro rolling out. Laurie, time for one more? Um, maybe very, very, very quickly. It, it, everyone will have like a sentence or maybe two. Uh, someone has asked, is this the moment when global education, where best practice from everywhere, shareable via these virtual platforms, really comes into its own? Yeah. Oh, I think so. Yeah, I do. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and, and facilitated by people like LearnIt, making these mm -hmm. webinars happen. Yeah, I think I, think I, have, I, I think I have given this suggestion uh, uh, some time ago, Laurie, when we had the conversation, and I said, this is a vacuum that needs to be filled. I think there are brilliant experiences around the world. Uh, we can pull them together and many, many around the world will benefit. And also uh, sometimes, you know, we have this challenge of the software kind of thing. Everyone is trying to, to these days, the, best, the highest number of requests we get is from the software companies in trying to tell us, uh, you know, how best they are. I think with those kind of experiences, 
our high tech firms or companies will also be able to get an idea of what we need, like what, what we are mindful of and what kind of solutions we, we look for and how all those solutions can be compatible with each other. I don't, I know we like compatibility and they don't, but uh, how that can be compatible so that the, the whole the entire globe can, can benefit from, from uh, a unified or kind of a, uh, you know, um, a, a unified system. I think it's really important that it's shared, but I think it's also really important that it's intelligently designed within the local context so that mm -hmm. everyone knows what everyone knows, but everyone doesn't try to do what everyone's doing if it's not absolutely right for what they are trying to achieve. Um, I think sort of centralised dictating of how education should be and giving no choice to people uh, and no agency is the absolute enemy of, of having a great global um, position. But everyone mobilising the knowledge that everyone has is a really powerful thing to do, I think. Okay. I'm aware that we're at our time. So I want to say thank you to Jim and Wahigia, to Shona, Lee and Julie. Thanks to the audience for your fabulous questions. Uh, someone had asked about the recording. The recording of this session will be available on our website at learnit.world. We'll also be sending it to you directly if you've registered for this webinar. Uh, we'll also follow up with a summary of the major points from today as we, as we always do. Uh, next week, we have two sessions for you. Uh, next Tuesday, I'll be in conversation with Kristen DeServo, who is Khan Academy's first chief learning officer, um, about what the lockdown has taught us about student agency. And Thursday, we'll be back with a panel uh, discussing the role of parents who have suddenly become much, much more closely associated with their children's learning, uh, which we discussed a little bit today. Uh, so we'll be talking about parent power. Uh, if you haven't done so already, I want to invite you to join the Learn It mailing list at learnit.world for details of these and other events uh, and to see more of our content and to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. And with that, take care, keep well, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Uh, and thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.